Uh, good morning, everyone who's already signed in. Um, we're just going to leave just a couple minutes. We will start half past, um, but we, we've only got a small number of attendees at the moment, so I'll just give it a couple of minutes. Okay, let's get started. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for um, signing into this um, second of the DBOT webinars um, from the 2019-2020 contract. Um, this webinar is focusing on outcomes-based commissioning. And thank you for giving up your time to um, sign into this webinar. Um, I appreciate that it is half term. Um, so if any of your colleagues are um, wanted to be part of this or there are people who you think would um, benefit from it afterwards, we will be sharing the recording with everyone who signed up this morning um, and you're welcome to share that further. So um, don't worry if anyone who you think would benefit is missing um, this morning. Uh, my name is Philippa Watts. I am Senior Programmes Officer for health at the Council for Disabled Children, um, and the vast majority of my work is on the DBOT contract. Um, DBOT, for those who aren't sure, stands for Delivering Better Outcomes Together. It's funded by the Department for Education and is delivered um, with a consortium of partners, um, including CDC, um, Mott McDonald, and NDTI. And we all have various different aspects of this contract, and we hold the strands on joint working. So I am joined by colleagues from Stockport this morning, uh, Julian Miller, James Brown and Michelle Booth. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves properly before they give their case study. Um, but we've been working with them on outcomes based commissioning um, across this year in some depth. Um, we haven't quite finished our, our work yet, um, but they will give you an, an insight into their journey so far and where they hope that it will be going um, in the future. So I will start off with a quick overview of um, the DBOT contract so far. Apologies to anyone who has listened to the first webinar on um, joint strategic needs assessment. Our slides are the same, so I won't be massively offended if you um, sign out for five minutes or so. Um, but then we will come back into the focus on outcomes-based commissioning, um, where I will give a brief presentation on what outcomes-based commissioning is, how it relates to the SEND reforms, um, and some examples of um, high-level outcomes frameworks from various different local areas across the country. Um, we'll then move on to the in-depth case study from Stockport, um, and you'll have an opportunity to ask questions at the end of that. So um, the first element of the DBOT contract is the regional events regional workshops. Um, so these are offered to each of the nine regions in England and they have a choice of four themes to choose from or they're welcome to have a bespoke alternative if none of those four themes uh, meet their requirements. So those four themes are aligning different programs, um, data and information sharing, personalisation um, and outcomes based commissioning. So you've got there a list of the events that we have delivered so far. Um, the one standing out there, the East of England, uh, they didn't want an event. Instead, they had some bespoke support on a cross-region JSNA analysis, um, and we have developed a resource from that analysis, which we will share with you. Um, we've still got the uh, West Midlands and the Southwest to come. Um, so if you are uh, in those regions, um, do drop me a line if you're interested in attending those events, and we can share a bit more information. 
what we've learned from these events so far is that um, there are pockets of excellent practice, um, but people aren't very good at shouting about them. Um, when things are going well, people seem to be a little bit reluctant about talking about them, or they may be anxious that actually they're not quite going as well as, as it first appears. But we really would recommend more proactive sharing with people within your areas, within your regions, and nationally. CDC are always happy to write up case studies and um, share things that are going well. So please do get in touch if you've got a piece of work that you think, yes, this is brilliant, this is really making a difference um, in the lives of children and young people with BEND. We are seeing that relationships between agencies are improving um, and our outcomes-based commissioning focus today really does help with that. Um, lots of pathways are under review. We're seeing a lot of people working on their neurodevelopmental diagnosis pathways, speech and language therapy pathways. Um, we're being asked for support around quite a lot of those. What we know, um, and this certainly isn't news to us, but we've seen this since the, the um, uh, initiation of the SEND report, Forms, is that visionary leadership really does make an impact. It really drives that cultural change, but there are still areas where that's not quite having as much impact as we would hope. We know that multidisciplinary team panels are working very well where they're in place, be those around um, commissioning for individual children or at a more strategic, um, but again, they're not being seen across the board. Some of the challenges, we're still seeing conflicts over funding. That I'm sure that uh, isn't news to you. Um, and we know that uh, transition to adulthood is still a cliff edge for many children and young people. And we hear particularly that getting adult services around the table is still very difficult, um, even where joint commission is work working well um, within the children's world. The funding uh, environment is still meaning that people have reluctance to take positive risks and innovation can be discouraged, um, which is a pity. And some of the examples I'll be sharing with you later in this session um, show the benefits that innovative thinking um, can really bring. We're hearing a lot that parental choice is still lacking. Um, there's still a relatively low take up for personal budgets. Um, and even those who do have personal budgets um, are struggling to to spend them really in the way that they want to um, because the options just aren't quite there. I'm sure you all feel that capacity and staff turnover is a real problem um, at all levels, practitioner level, all the way up to the strategic uh, senior leader level. And capacity is a struggle for everyone. And um, infrastructure, um, particularly IT, is a real barrier, um, particularly around data collection and information sharing to support that joint commissioning. Um, and I'll talk very, very briefly about that a bit later today. Um, but that's something that we're, we're talking to a number of areas about. Uh, very quickly, just to run through the regional events um, on data to support strategic outcomes. So this is what Yorkshire and Humber had. Um, we gave them a very brief overview of the national context on joint working, drawing on a number of different reports, um, for example, um, the uh, National Audit Office report, the Select Committee report, um, exclusions, and a number of others. Um, we gave them the introduction to outcomes-based commissioning that I will be giving you um, in the next few minutes, as well as the examples that you'll see. Um, and then we had some discussions around sharing and learning about what's going on well um, and where the challenges are in that region. Uh, we then had an in-depth case study from Leeds, uh, who are doing some really good work around um, data to monitor their strategic outcomes. And that isn't something that we'll be able to get to in depth today because we've only got an hour. But if, um, as we go through this uh, presentation, you think, oh, actually, that's something we really could do with some help with, um, do let us know. Um, we then did a bit of uh, action planning around prioritizing um, quick wins and steps for the future. Um, and that led on to a regional discussion about would a regional approach um, help to ease some of those sticking points. That's the region events. Um, the next uh, element as part of this DBOT contract is the bespoke support that it has to offer. Um, so we have these pots of days which are available to support areas um, with a written statement of action. That's the larger pot of days and then the smaller pot for those who either haven't been inspected yet or um, have been inspected and weren't obliged to write a written statement of action. We had between five and seven days to support each area. That looks um, very different depending on what support the area is looking for. It is a bespoke offer, so that might be face-to-face -face delivery, it might be training, it might be workshops, or it might be more desk-based and reviewing policies and documents. 
Um, but whatever support we give um, as we're the joint working strand it is around multi-agency um, and working issues. So getting those stakeholders together around the table from education, health, social care um, and parent carers. Some of the things we've done so far this year um, are around the development of high level outcomes frameworks. Um, we've done, delivered a number of different sessions on um, EHC plans and outcomes training, outcomes there at the strategic level and then down at the individual level. We've had some conversations about how you connect those together. We've done a few neurodevelopmental diagnostic pathway reviews. Um, we've looked at various uh, training strategies and policies for different local areas. We've supported with a peer challenge review, um, and I'll add to this now actually slight update that we um, are also doing some in-house deep dives um, with the local area on sticking points and the JSNA analysis that I mentioned earlier. Um, I'll say at this point, um, this contract ends with the financial year. Um, however, we are, I said, phrase this in the way that I'm allowed to phrase it, um, strongly hopeful that there will be a very similar support offer in the next financial year, although we're waiting for final confirmation from the DfE for that. Um, we should have it, I think, literally any minute now. Um, so if as we go through this, you think, yes, actually, I really would like some support with that. Our area would really benefit from that we are starting to have conversations around support for next year um, on the proviso that, that we get the approval to go ahead. Um, so my contact details are at the end of this presentation, so do get in touch if you would like some further support. What have we learned from this bespoke support? Um, most of this will um, resonate with you, I'm sure. No challenges. If you are facing some difficulty, somebody else somewhere definitely is facing the same one. Um, and our job as a region, as a national organisation, is to try and bring those together um, and work on those collectively. We know the financial pressure is still very high. We know staff turnover is a problem. Um, something specific to this uh, bespoke support around strategic outcomes. Um, that the having ownership of them is really important, and I'll go into this a bit more when I'm giving you some examples, um, but I'll come back to that. And we know there's an appetite for a standardized EHC plan template. So let's move into what you're all here for, which is the outcomes-based commissioning. What is outcomes-based commissioning? So this is a, a process which is based on Mark Friedman's results-based accountability. Um, and I've, I've put the quote here there, and I think it's worth looking at it in full. Um, I can move my little box to the controls. Um, it's a data-driven decision-making process to help communities and organizations get beyond talking about problems to taking action to solve problems. And I'm sure you can see that fits very nicely in with the um, work that local areas are doing around the SEND reforms currently. It sounds complicated, but really it's, it's quite straightforward. It's a shift in mindset and a shift in approach from thinking about what did we do to what did we achieve? We are very good at saying um, we delivered X number of this, we did Y number of that, but we find it much more difficult to say, and actually what difference did that make in people's lives? How did that intervention impact on them and their families and um, improve um, their outcomes and their day-to-day -day existence? So it's around asking these three questions. Firstly, how much did we do? That's the simple one. Secondly, how well did we do it? So looking at quality of delivery. And number three, the big impact question, is anybody better off? So how does this connect to the SEND reforms? Um, it is quite a direct link. Um, there is nothing in the same code of practice that says ab you absolutely must have a high level outcomes framework. However, there, there is this section here, which you can see, uh, which has that should. Local partners should identify the outcomes that matter to children and young people with SEN or disabilities to inform the planning and delivery of services and the monitoring of how well services have secured those outcomes. So while it isn't mandatory to have um, an outcomes framework, it is highly, highly recommended and you would have to have a really good reason when the inspectors come calling not to have one. What we find is that it creates a really, really solid foundation for joint commissioning, because what it does is it gets everyone involved in children and young people's lives um, on the same page, around the table, saying, actually, what do we want life to look like for these children and young people? And how does my role fit into that overall vision? And the other thing that we found is that while 
a lot of people that we work with are looking at this from an SEND perspective. When we start these workshops, very quickly, somebody puts their hand up and says, well, isn't this what we want for all children and young people? Why should this just be SEND focused? Um, and which you would say, yes, you're quite right, but are the right people in the room to um, take that forward? There are some areas we work with who've said they want a universal approach from the outset, and that's fantastic. Um, but if that's not within your gift, or you feel like you just need to start working on it in a slightly smaller context and then build out, that's absolutely fine as well. So what do we expect the benefits of outcomes-based commissioning being? The first um, is that it keeps children and young people and families' wishes front and centre. Um, the outcomes-based commissioning has to build around what children and young people want from their lives and how professionals can support that rather than what can professionals deliver and what can that do for children and families. So it just switches that perspective a little bit. Um, and it promotes that holistic view of a child. It's not thinking, I'm an OT, I can help with um, buttoning shirts or, or whatever that may be. I'm a physio, I can help with um, movement. It's thinking about how do I contribute as a professional to this child living a happy and fulfilled life. And that means the professionals have that shared vision for how they're working across the piece, which I think is really good for motivation as well. Um, it's, it's a complex picture that we're working in and things are difficult. Um, and what we found is that people really like having that perspective of um, looking at what they're doing for children rather than what they're doing just on a day-to-day -day basis. And what that comes from is having that focus on lived experience rather than the delivery of service. And underpinning all of this is really good evidence-based commissioning. So we're capturing data um, on what impact are we making, how are children's lives improving, how are children experiencing life in our area, and that tells us, are we commissioning the right things? Do things need to change? Should we be recommissioning, decommissioning? Where can we learn from best practice? So I've sort of mentioned this already. It is a cultural shift. Um, changing from the outputs focus to the outcomes focus. And this um, graphic, I think, just shows that the key change into making this happen is um, making sure that child or young person has um, an active role rather than a passive one, be that in their individual lives, um, at the operational level with the services they receive, um, and at the strategic level um, with commissioning. It is a big shift, and we do quite often find in workshops that um, there's a lot of enthusiasm in the room but we know that it's, it's a big ask for people to change um, this way of thinking and to really implement it in their day-to-day -day work. Um, so it's not easy, and we appreciate that, um, but when it's done well, it really does make a difference. Uh, just to flag this up very quickly, the Marmot Life Course approach, this is partially just to say um, why getting it right for children early really matters, um, and I'm sure you're all aware of that, so I won't labour the point. But it's also to point out when we're developing strategic outcomes for children and young people, there's a balance between looking at them as children and the outcomes they want in the here and now, thinking about um, the future and the outcomes that you want to prepare them for as adults. So thinking about preparing for adulthood pathways and looking to the future. So while we're developing these, it's a real, real balance of getting that right. And as I say, the here and now um, and the future. Um, I'll be sending all these slides around afterwards, so just so don't worry that I'm going through these pretty quickly. Uh, I'll also include the links to the documents that these slides come from if you want to look at them in more detail. Uh, this is a slide from NHS England. Um, they're commissioning for effective service transformation. Um, I know it's a little small and you may not be able to read it, so again, I'll share it, but this did, just to point out this outcomes-based commissioning approach isn't just something that CDC have decided is probably a good thing, um, but there are other organisations using it, um, and I'll include um, the link to Mark Friedman's work, which is uh, open source, so you can see really the breadth of it um, if you're interested in that. But this is just to point out that that sort of green tealy section, uh, five and six, focused on delivering improved value and outcomes and selecting commissioning mechanisms that will, um, I, I would imagine that should say, make that improvement. Um, so. It's a mechanism that others are using um, and we're not just imposing it on you uh, because we've decided it's a good thing to do. So let's move into now some examples of um, what high level outcome statements look like. 
These ones will come from National Voices from the Think Local Act personal um, project. Um, not all, strictly speaking, um, outcomes that we would anticipate seeing in an outcomes framework, but it's a really nice example of um, one way of presenting them. So these I statements um, really strongly represent the voice of the child. I'm listened to, I'm respected and valued for who I am, and so on. Um, I, I come from a children's voice background, so I am always a little bit wary around I statements and making sure that they have come from a child's perspective. Um, it's very easy for us as adults to sit in a room and write some, what we would anticipate children wanting to say, um, but I'm very uh, firm in saying that um, there does need to be work with children and young people to make sure that if you are using I statements, they are framed in the way that they want them to be framed. And I'm sure my colleagues from Stockport will, will talk a little bit about their work with young people in firming up their outcome statements in a little bit. These are the Hertfordshire Outcome Bs. Um, so we have a written up case study on these, which again, I'll include the link to when I send out the slides. Um, this is a really nice, simple, uh, straightforward graphic on the left here. Be happy, be independent, be ambitious, be safe, be healthy and be resilient. Um, I think you'll agree that these kinds of statements are to anybody, really. It's what I would want to see in my life. I'm sure it's what you would want to see in yours, in your children. Um, in nieces and nephews and your friends um, across the board really. Um, so when I, I mentioned earlier about is it an SEND focus or is it a universal focus and how people quite often get to this point and go oh we all want that don't we let's make it universal. Um, so that option is there. This image on the right um, this has come from um, their work with their looked after children. This is a, a measure that was developed by um, Empower about how do we identify whether children and young people are making progress towards these outcomes. Um, so they've developed this um, sort of cobweb matrix um, to measure their, their children's um, change and development um, over time in that LAC cohort. So this came together from Hertfordshire after their um, send inspection, which said that they needed to do a bit more around joint working. So they said, okay, well, we need something that we're behind and um, hang our hats on. I suppose, as a, as a foundation for all the rest of our commissioning. Um, I am trying to follow up with Hertfordshire about having an update to their case study, um, looking at actually what impact has this made for children and young people uh, as a result. Um, so I will um, share that with our networks once we have it. This is from Leeds. So Leeds is a universal outcomes framework, not just for children with SEND, um, very similar to the outcome Bs. Um, children and young people are safe from harm, they do well at all levels of learning and have skills for life, they enjoy healthy lifestyles, they have fun growing up, and they're active citizens who feel they have a voice and influence. Again, I'm sure you'll agree, these are things that we all would like in our own lives. This is from the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists, very similar. I'm able to learn, I'm able to achieve my goals, I feel valued, included and accepted, I'm healthy and happy, I feel supported and safe. I'm in control of my life. So this is something for speech and language therapists to look at how their work and their role supports children and young people to achieve these outcomes. This is one from Essex. Um, I know it's a lot, lot to look at um, in a slide. So if I can just draw your attention to the, um, that middle green column with the, the words in bold there, stable, resilient, safe families, emotionally healthy, physically healthy, involved and connected and positive futures. Um, and so if you look at that, that full document, it explains how that ties into with um, where that's come from and where that's going. Um, but again, those are sort of the, the key statements with some short descriptors there just to the right. Um, the interesting thing about this one, so this is Essex's universal children and young people's plan. Um, Essex got pulled up in their send inspection for not having an outcomes framework for children with, and I was involved in the written statement of action call um, shortly after that inspection, and um, they were talking about it, and I said, but you, but you do have one because I've seen it, I know it's there. Um, and while they have this universal strategy, they hadn't considered using it in an SEND context um, to their um, shame, I suppose. Um, so you may find that you already have things in your area that would do or that can be adapted or that can be expanded and built upon 
that aren't being used in an SEND context. So when we work with local areas um, on these outcomes-based commissioning, we do a bit of a dig to see what we can find that we might be able to borrow from um, and learn from. Before I move on, um, just keep an eye on the time, um, but I will quickly say that while these lists of outcomes look very similar and paint in broad brushstrokes what a happy, fulfilled life looks like for a child, and it may be tempting to say, actually, I can draw a list up of that, you know, this afternoon, and then we've got one. The process is really important. Um, that process of getting everyone in a room together and getting stakeholders from all sorts of different backgrounds together, including parents, and I am doing one of these next week, which is going to include children and young people as well that's going to be a first I'm looking forward to that um, but that process of going through and thinking what do we want for children and young people's lives and then going on a on a journey of okay we have these statements what does that mean in terms of the work we're already doing what does that mean in terms of our existing strategies and policies um, and then what does that mean in terms of data and how do we measure these things how do we know that we're making progress towards these um, outcomes is really really important partially because it means you've got ownership of it in your local area and there's always someone in these workshops who puts their hand up and goes isn't this just every child matters again and we say yes it doesn't look dissimilar but because this is something that is developed in your area no one can take it away from you then you can build it into all of your work into your strategies into your commissioning um, and it's yours uh, and while they do look very similar, um, that process is really, really important. Um, I'm going to show you another um, quick example. This one from Camden isn't strictly speaking an outcomes framework, but is it an example of how a framework can be used as a commissioning tool? Um, again, this we have a written up case study DC website, so I will share it um, for more detail. But Camden were finding that they had all these different providers um, and they were all having different data. They got different data platforms, different data sources, and that meant that that tell it once approach wasn't really working very well. They weren't able to share um, and that was frustrating for parents. Um, so what they did is they have um, uh, the London Borough of Camden and Camden CCG jointly commissioned this outcomes-based integrated service. Um, so the, this is a whole sort of restructuring thing. So uh, staff for all in, employment is linked to provider. So for example, all the OTs are um, employed by one hospital rather than having them spread about. And they also have this central data hub, um, which holds an electronic patient record, one record for each child that brings everything together. They hold the performance data info and they also hold the clinical leadership. What this looks like in practice is that each of these providers um, have the same KPIs and they're fairly basic high level KPIs and that is that services are delivered in a timely manner, that families have a positive experience, um, that services um, are supported by multidisciplinary planning, that all children have a good transition planning experience and that they all have a transition plan in place and that all children are meeting their individual goals, um, for example in their EHC plan. And the way this works is that all providers must meet each of those KPIs. And if they do that, they get top-up funding. So if all the providers um, hit those timeliness targets, then they get a bit of additional money. If even one provider doesn't hit that timeliness target, then none of them receive the additional funding. So everyone is accountable for everyone else's um, achievements and in meeting those goals. And they found this really, really effective. I think when they initially put this in place, they had quite a big amount of um, money for that additional funding, and that, that's gradually got smaller, but it is still there. Um, and what they found is that they're consistently meeting or surpassing most of their key performance targets. They work much more collaboratively, um, and they're reshaping things to reflect that collaborative approach. Family confidence and satisfaction levels are high, and they do have some um, analysis to, to back that up. Um, and they're also finding they're working a bit more innovatively um, around their approaches. Um, and they're now moving to a single outcome measurement process, which again, I'm trying to follow up um, so that I can get a bit more detail in that case study into how they're measuring things. 
So that's uh, maybe a little segue um, away from the outcomes based commissioning, but that's how you can use it as a tool um, to create an alliance around those um, outcomes. So what is the process for developing an outcomes based commissioning? Um, this graphic sort of explains the, the full journey. Um, and in terms of what CDC can do to support your journey, we would come into a local area with the anticipation that you already have a, a good strategic vision, which has been co-produced. And then on the day, we would work with you to develop that draft set of outcomes. Um, and obviously we can only do that with the people in the room and we would anticipate there being further work, further consultation, co-production um, with other stakeholders who aren't represented. So more parents and children and young people. We would then, um, this is in an NHS language, so it's talking about models of care, but we would then start talking about how the services that you're delivering and how the work streams that you have are supported by and can support those outcomes. So um, we, what we don't want to do is anyone leave thinking, oh, good Lord, I've got an awful lot more to do now. This is, this is more pressure. We want it to, to fit in um, with what you're already doing and look at how things can be adapted rather than putting more pressure on you. And the same comes when we're talking about data. Um, there it says at the bottom how the outcomes will be measured. So we would spend time looking at where you're already collecting data on children and young people. Um, can those data sources be adapted? Can those uh, measurements and indicators be adapted? Um, and where are the gaps, which is quite often in the qualitative data, so in the, the sort of experiential stuff from children and young people and their families. Um, but we think about, you know, how those those outcomes particularly the ones around happiness and resilience and that kind of thing are um, a little scary i think for data people how on earth do you measure happiness so we have discussions around well you know what are the indicators for that how do we know um, that a child is happy or, or whatever so we have those conversations and start thinking about what you might measure and how that matches up with the data you already um this orange column uh is about so your your um data infrastructure and your sharing mechanism. So we can talk a little bit about section 75 agreements and level three data sharing agreements, um, but we can't go into that too much in one day. And that's a, something for you to take forward. Um, and then thinking about how you use that for contracting, how you use that for commissioning um, and monitoring your services. Just a very quick slide on data before I hand over to Stockport. How am I doing? A minute over. Um, this is uh, Mark Freeman's data model. So we've said already that we, we're very good at knowing how much we've done, what did we deliver, that top left-hand corner. Um, and what we want to do is start looking at these other boxes. Um, what change did we produce? How well we did, did we deliver um, our services? And what quality of change? And again, that big final question, is anyone better? How do you know you've made a difference? So that's very much a whistle-stop tour. And I do apologize that that's squeezed into, into an hour, but I hope that's given you a flavor of what outcomes based commissioning is and the journey that CDC can take you on um, in your work with that. Um, as I say, do get in touch with us if you have questions or you want something like this in your area um, and we can start talking about it. But I'm now going to hand over to my colleagues in Stockport. Um, who will talk to you in a little bit more detail about what uh, the work that they've done and um, how they've got where they are and sort of looking ahead to what's coming next. So I'm going to mute myself now and hand over. Thank you, Philippa. Um, so my name's Gillian Miller. Um, I'm the um, Acting Director of Commissioning in Stockport, Stockport CCG, and I'm here with um, my colleagues James Brown, Head of Communications, and Michelle Booth, and we will together um, hopefully share a little bit of our journey with you, um, which we've been on and since 2018 when we had our uh, written statement of action um, following uh, our SEND um, inspection. And um, fair to say that was a very challenging um, period of, of time. Um, our SEND inspection uh, found five key areas um, of uh, 
improvement needed by Stockport. And I'm just going to go through those a little bit to give you a bit of context of where we're coming from and where our outcomes framework has originated. Um, so in, in those areas that uh, Ofsted identified was that Stockport needed to have a really effective approach to jointly plan and commission services. And included in that was our need to really um, know um, our population and to really understand our population of children and young people with SEND. Um, secondly, we needed to improve our um, the social, uh, effectively assess and, and meet children, young people's social care needs within particularly the HCP planning process. Um, thirdly, a real need to involve children and young people and families in meaningful, effective co-production of services, resources, um, and support children and young peoples and families um, in this journey. So that was a really been a key uh, thread going through all of our work subsequently. Fourthly, we needed to gain a sh shared understanding by our local leaders um, of the needs of children and young people and their education, health and care outcomes. And fifthly, then to be able to effectively assess the effectiveness um, of our local system in supporting improved outcomes for children and young people. So that was the context. It was definitely um, a bit of a, a wake up call and a challenge and really has um, been a catalyst um, for our journey um, since that time. So um, our response to that um, from 2018 was we set up a series of engagement events. Um, so sorry, Philippa, could we just go back um, a couple of slides? Yeah, just to that slide, thank you. So um, we set up a series of um, engagement events um, where we spoke to over 400 um, families about their experiences of stock services and to really try to listen and understand um, you know what our families uh, were telling us in, in terms of um, what really mattered to them and to their children um, and that was really the very um, core has been the core um, essence and, and beginning of our uh, journey to improve outcomes and to develop our outcomes framework. We also set up a, a SEND improvement board um, with our key leaders um, across education, health and care to govern and drive the improvement across these five key work stream areas. And that feeds very much into Philippa's point that she made earlier around ownership at the most senior level of this improvement journey and in gaining that shared understanding of the outcomes that matter to our children and young peoples. And that's been a, um, a hugely important part of our, our journey. And sitting within the SEND Improvement Board, we have a, a, a joint commissioning uh, group, which I co-chair, which brings together key um, stakeholders um, and key partners across the system to develop um, a joint uh, commissioning strategy um, and priorities to really ensure that we are focusing on, um, you know, improvements that really matter to our families. And so our key SEND um, priorities are, there are five of them, and they are co-production, joint commissioning, inclusion, outcomes, and workforce. And so specifically around the joint commissioning and um, that uh, joint commissioning strategy, um, we want to be absolutely focused on commissioning for the outcomes that matter to our families um, and to ensure that it's informed by a really good knowledge of our local population. So um, our joint commissioning work began with developing a, a joint strategic needs assessment, which I know was a previous um, webinar that's available if anyone would like to see that. We then brought together all of the intelligence that we've been gathering and um, CDC as part of this program have really helped us to shape a series of workshops and a program where we have been bringing together our key stakeholders um, across the system with our families and children and young people to really learn from all of that best practice that we heard about in Philippa's presentation. Um, and to make sure we are really listening to our experts by experience um, to develop a shared understanding um, also across the system around how um, outcomes framework and outcomes framework can support um, our commissioning. So as a result of that, we um, have uh, through these workshops been on this journey to develop um, our outcomes.
Just the next slide, please, Philippa. That's also been involved by um, some local case studies where we have our um, parents in partnership um, have undertaken 10 in-depth case studies with families who have told us um, their stories and have helped us again to crystallize in depth some of the you know really important themes and needs of our families so some uh, quotes have been um, included here but very much the themes of really um, understanding the outcomes about the whole family um, about the whole journey um, not just about accessing or being on a diagnostic pathway but really understanding that um, these children and young people um, are often on many pathways um, and it's the outcome at the end of that that really matters to them really understanding that um, you know, children's voices need to be and young know, people's voices need to be at the heart of those plans uh, and the heart of that decision making. So um, together that wealth of intelligence has, um, has really informed um, our outcome statement which we'll go on and, um, and share with you. But at this point I'm going to hand over to James who will take you through um, our kind of co-production and involvement journey. Gillian. Um, so I think as Gillian's outline, but also as Philippa was discussing in the presentation earlier, this has been an ongoing process uh, over the last sort of 18 months. Um, and one of the things um, that we undertook was a, a huge listening exercise uh, to understand what the lived experience was really like for families and for children and young people, um, which very early on, highlighted why we needed to move towards an outcome uh, an outcomes framework and out based uh, sorry, outcomes based commissioning um, so the slide in front of you uh, looks quite busy but in essence there are three cogs um, and these were distilled from thousands of comments from families uh, young people and actually professionals as well um, to understand actually what was it like receiving services um, being a child uh, with uh, special education needs, uh, but actually also the professionals working those services. So the first slide, the sort of the, the reds and pinks and purples, really is about what matters. So those those things that really are at the heart of um, uh, uh, driving towards the outcomes. What really matters to families and professionals, um, you know, involving actively listening the values. Um, the second cog uh, was about actually how do we change. So if we're gonna if we're really gonna move together and improve the quality of services uh, and move towards outcomes uh, for young people what do we need to do differently uh, both as families and as professionals to make sure actually we can make that a reality um, so there was uh, change required there was shared decision making and there, there was that connection so something that families told us quite clearly was uh, they needed that single point of contact rather than having to navigate a very complex system on their own uh, and then thirdly, actually, the, the green slide, uh, the, sorry, the green cog in the corner, um, was actually really is about those benefits of doing what matters, which then drives that outcomes-based commissioning. It's about, you know, what is best for the families and young people. That joined up system, uh, as Philippa alluded to in the earlier presentation about actually, you know, system partners working collaboratively uh, together with families and young people. Uh, that co-production of services uh, and actually then that's driving uh, those better outcomes uh, and actually that was it, these became our principles um, that we then distilled even further and uh, my colleague will, will talk about in a minute to our uh, actual outcomes themselves but th the this was based on thousands of comments that we received um, which was hugely valuable but also uh, just underlined uh, the, the sort of incredible depth of challenge that we had. So if we just move to the next slide, um, one of the critical things that young people told us, and this image in the middle, this tree with the thumbprints, was actually developed by um, one of uh, the SEND ambassadors, and the thumbprints that you can see on that tree, that's what they are, um, were the thumbprints of all the young people that attended one of our first workshops uh, and actually we use this on all, all of our co-production material just to highlight actually the importance of young people's uh, voices at the heart of everything we do 
But actually through the engagement work that we were doing earlier on when we we're thinking about outcomes, uh, what was interesting was that young people told us directly that they understood that their, their, their parents and their carers had their best interests at heart, but actually quite often they disagreed with uh, what the adults were telling us were the outcomes that they wanted for their children. They actually had sometimes very, very different aspirations. And they said they wanted their own voice. So we created a Send Young Ambassadors group. Uh, they meet weekly. Uh, we see them um, at least once a month, if not twice a month. Uh, they do their own thing at other times and then come back to us. Um, and actually they've really helped uh, test and challenge and look at the outcomes. Um, and what we've got here, hopefully it'll work for you, is just a 60 second video that actually the young people made themselves, they helped write the questions, they helped do the scripting, um, and actually it was about their journey. And once the video's finished, I'll hand across to my colleague, Michelle. The views and the voice of those young people can really influence and give advice and support to us on how better to do things here in Stockport. Yeah, that's great. You get my name, I can get involved with everybody, to know each other, and meet different people, get to go to Ireland as a family. Yeah, it's good. Games are right, quite good, where we all get to have a chance to meet. I've enjoyed it. I've listened to it, but I've just joined in, and I think it was actually very good. It's just so important that we hear your voices as we develop services. We really want to work with you. Um, and hear from you about your experiences both at school and at the health and care services that you receive. Did that work okay? Hello? Did that work okay? Oh. Philippa Gillian speaking. Yes, we could hear it perfectly at our side. We're just going to hand over to Michelle Booth now, who will um, take us through the act. I feel like can you hear me? You speak. No, no problem, Michelle. I'll just pop your slides back up. Lovely, thank you very much. Um, can, can you hear me now? Sorry, we seem to be having a couple of problems with the muting arrangement. Okay, I'm just going to carry on. Um, so the results of the work outlined by James and Gillian led to the seven I statements that you can now see on the screen. Once these had been initially co-produced in draft form, we tested them further with our group of young ambassadors um, who have a range of needs and they are from across the borough. And that was adding to the rigour, as Philippa mentioned earlier on, that we really need to make sure that they are at the heart of what we want for them. So the young people were asked what the statements actually mean to them and how much each of the statements matter um, and those that resonate the most with them. And they decided originally they were in quite linear form and the young people felt it was really important for them to be um, circular because some of the statements may well depend upon the outcomes of the other statements and they're not necessarily in that linear structure. Um, the ones that resonated with them most were actually that people who care and love uh, them are enabled to do this by our work and process. 
processes. And this was because um, the young people obviously feel that they rely upon these people very strongly in their daily lives. The two statements that relate to enjoying good health and well-being and feeling safe were meant to be very, very important as well, as the young people felt they are more willing to participate if they enjoy the outcomes of both of those statements. The statements about having my voice heard also meant a lot to the young people, but they quite rightly felt that it should be changed to reflect the action that we should take as a result of hearing their voice. So what originally read as my voice is heard has now become my voice is heard and acted upon. And part of the feedback from parents in this process has also stated that voice may actually be seen to exclude those children and young people who are non-verbal and that we need to be clear about how we capture um, their views in meeting the outcome. Some of the other statements have actually also been amended based upon young people's feedback and these include I am happy and have people I can trust which was changed from I am happy and have friends and this was because the young people felt that these two can be very distinctly different things that you can actually be happy without necessarily having friends and also that those trusted people in their lives might include a wider group such as key workers or family members so that's the reason for the change to that statement and similarly, what now reads, I'm confident and able to achieve my goals, has changed from dreams. And this is because young people believe goals are more realistic. Um, dreams might mean winning the lottery, whereas goals might mean being able to get into education or into employment. And whilst it's good to have a dream, they felt that goals would actually be easier to measure in terms of their, out their own outcomes. So it was very insightful feedback from young people. Also, um, feeling part of the local community was changed from being active and included in the local community. And it was felt that feeling part of the community is different from being involved in it. Um, activity might mean different things depending on an individual's mobility or cognitive skills. And also community can mean a different thing in terms of whether it relates to home, to school or to work, um, or even the local groups that they might take part in. So these are sort of the, the latest draft of our statements and linked to what Philip has said earlier on about us wanting to achieve outcomes for all of our children, not just those we send. We are actually now out to survey with the wider public um, so that we can get feedback from them. And we'll take this forward because we've yet to have our final workshop with CDC um, to conclude the work around the statements. So moving on just to touch on some of the enablers and challenges. If we can just move to the next slide. Thank you, Philippa. Um, just to touch briefly on what's helped and hindered us so far. Um, it's important to note that we've got really passionate people involved in this area of work. Um, there's been hugely um, successful partnership working across the agencies and the groups involved. And I think it's been mentioned by Gillian, by James, by Philippa earlier on that this has been, you know, it is a vital way. It's the only way that you can actually do this work well. Um, so we have parent care representatives on all of our work streams that support the improvement journey and this includes our parent care forum as well as other individual parents and our SEND board provides real ownership and accountability for all areas of the work. The joint strategic feeds assessment as mentioned by Gillian earlier on um, gave us a hugely valuable baseline of data to work with so that we could really understand the needs of families and young people and the networks that we have across the local area and the wider region, as well as our work with CDC, um, have also been crucial in supporting our progress to date. Some of the challenges, and we can't deny that they exist, um, are around understanding how what we mean by each of the statements might be different for every individual, and that we capture the breadth of meaning to ensure it can be realistically used for driving forward our changes. Also, using information from our daily contacts is a challenge so we have lots of conversations on a daily basis with various professionals and we need to find an effective way of capturing the value of the feedback we receive in this way um, and for both of these points it's definitely a challenge for us to create meaningful ways of measuring this qualitative data in the context of the outcomes uh, but perhaps something we could learn from what we've seen about the Hertfordshire they Hertfordshire bees in the previous slide um, so that's where we're up to in terms of the I statements themselves and I'll pass back to Gillian around the impact.
Okay, um, so Gillian Miller speaking again here. Thank you. I'm very aware of time, so I'm going to just very quickly. In terms of impact, we are still on the journey. Um, ultimately, our aim is for our outcomes framework to be a, a really key fundamental tool for us to be able to be informed and to measure whether our commissioned services for um, children and young people with SEND are improving health and care and well-being outcomes. Um, however, the actual journey itself is, I think, has been mentioned by Philippa earlier, is, is in itself um, impactful. Um, it has brought us together as um, partners across health and education and care and with our families to gain this joint shared understanding of what is really important to our families, not to us as you know, system or leaders, but to our families and to our children and young people. And to really focus on the whole pathway of care, not just you know, improving health services or improving um, uh, the processes for um, EHCP plans, but to really understand what that means is making a difference um, at the end of the day to our children and young people um, and co-production, doing it together has been just that key theme that's really um, creating the impact. Um, it is also shaping, as we've mentioned, our joint commissioning strategy. It's informed our seven key joint commissioning priorities. It's influencing our culture, as I've mentioned, and will be influencing our workforce strategy strategy as we develop that. And just moving lastly on to next steps, um, we, with um, the ongoing support of CDC, we have our third workshop taking place in March where we'll be bringing together the results of the survey that we're undertaking on the um, seven statements that Michelle mentioned and, and outlined, um, and bringing together all of the feedback to date to finalize our outcomes. We'll be having a very strong focus on measurement. We've developed um, with our business intelligence teams across the system a fantastic performance dashboard, um, bringing together all of our key metrics. And we will be aligning those to the outcome statements to um, bring together that as a complete framework. We also very aware that we need to develop um, a survey or some form of mechanism to bring the qualitative data together to um, really understand how to measure and baseline the um, softer, you know, the quality the qualitative measures, um, as Philippa mentioned earlier, to measure things, you know, to the experience of being happy, the experience of being safe and secure. Um, we are, I think as mentioned, we are keen to expand, expand our outcomes framework to all children in Stockport, so we've already expanded our survey to the wider population. Um, also key is to put this to contracts, um, as Philippa mentioned, the Camden model, we are keen to ensure that this has real teeth by putting it into contracts and ultimately we are keen to continue um, our journey with CDC to really test out um, the measure, um, the impact of this journey. I think CDC have brought this incredible um, you know, best practice and reflection and helping us to um, really ensure that we are following best practice practice along this journey um, and, and really delivering what matters to our families. So I will end there. Thank Hello, you very much. Hello. Thank you very much, uh, Gillian, James and Michelle for sharing that with us. Um, the stop, I've been really, really enjoyed actually working with Stockport. Um, quite closely on this um, and I'm really really looking forward to see where it goes um, in the future. We've got a couple of minutes left so um, I'm just going to oh, give you a quick opportunity if you have any questions. There is a chat box, um, there should be, you should have a little sort of control panel um, on your screen that has a chat box. Um, if you have any burning questions you have three minutes to ask them, um, either of me uh, or of um, the colleagues from Stockport, um, anything we don't have time to address now, I will pick up um, by email um, and you're welcome to email um, anyway. Any questions? I seem to know I've lost my chat box. Oh, there we go. Are you using the annual review process to collect data? Anyone from Stockport able to answer that? Are you using the annual review process to collect data? 
speaking. Um, could you the, could the questioner just explain specifically the annual review process? Are we talking about through EHCP, EHCP plans? Is that the question? Yes. Yeah. Through EHCP. So um, we are um, currently putting the uh, our EHCP uh, plans and processes has been one of our improvement work streams, um, and that that is you know developing and becoming um, very very much focused on the outcomes that that matter to that individual child and young person. Um, the output of that is going into something called Liquid Logic. Um, and we are now in the process of um, trying to understand how to take those out, the out, outputs of those annual reviews and feed them into um, our wider outcomes framework. So yes, the intention is to do that. The mechanism for doing that yet is still um, in development, but absolutely our intention. And there's also a question about using apps to collect the uh, voices of children and families. Is that maybe maybe in the future? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, sorry. So um, we're exploring a number of different options to how we engage with young people. So, for example, um, whilst apps uh, tend to be um, uh, quite attractive to organisations, uh, one thing that young people told us, for example, when we were trying to work with them and the Send Young Ambassadors, was they prefer to use things like WhatsApp as an ongoing engagement tool, and we, we do use that all the time. But whether we would create a, an app specifically for Send or the Outcomes Framework, uh, at this stage is probably unclear, primarily because of cost, but more, more so to do with the uptake, and whether or not we'd actually use existing methods um, to engage with people. Um, in, in, in the future, we might look at the outcomes framework and how we present that digitally. Um, and actually, if you did create an app, we could use a web-based app so it's easy to update. But in terms of engagement and ongoing involvement, we would probably just use existing channels rather than creating something new. Thanks, James. Um, there's one more question, which really is one for me um, about some support. I will get in touch with... Uh, with you, Tiffany, um, regarding your question. Um, so I'll follow up with that with you afterwards. For anybody else, um, very, very much, um, everyone for, for contributing to that. Um, I hope this has been really useful for you, um, just as a sort of start of a 10, I suppose. If you would like some further support, um, as I say, we're very, very hopeful that there will be something similar in the next financial year, but I can make no guarantees at this stage. But um, my contact details are up on the screen there, as are my colleague Ryan's, um, he's, he's our Niblo. Um, either of us will be able to talk to you about this um, and get some conversations started um, with the expectation that we would be able to carry on um, in the next financial year. So again, I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope it's been useful. I will share the slides um, with everyone who signed up on this list and do feel free to share the recording of this presentation um, with colleagues um, far and wide. Thanks very much um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Philippa. No problem.